It's uh, 4 p.m. Welcome, everybody, to the 12th episode of our webinar series, Artificial Intelligence and Religion, um, co-organized by the Center for Religious Studies of Fondazione Bruno Kesta and the uh, Center uh, for Information and Communication Technology of uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Um, today's speaker is uh, Professor Yorick Wilkes. Uh, his talk is entitled, uh, entitled Artificial Intelligence and Religion. Before um, introducing today's speaker very briefly, um, uh, let me remind you that this meeting is uh, being recorded. So if you do not want to be recorded, keep your cameras uh, uh, switched off and uh, your mics muted. Um, in any case, during the, the presentation, I would like to ask you to, to uh, uh, switch off your, your cameras and mute your microphones so as to avoid um, uh, interferences and, and uh, uh, to uh, save bandwidth. Um, Yorick Wilkes is uh, Emeritus Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Sheffield. He is a, a Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute um, and a senior scientist at the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. Um, so Professor Wilkes uh, has worked for a long time in, uh, in uh, artificial intelligence with a focus on um, natural language processing, computer processing of language, uh, knowledge and belief. Um, and currently his research focuses on um, the question of um, uh, whether and uh, if so, how um, software agents, artificial agents, can be said to have uh, identifiable personalities or identities. Um, he is also the principal investigator of a uh, recently started uh, a project on which bears uh, uh, directly on our topic on um, uh, understanding spiritual intelligence, funded by the Templeton Foundation and coordinated by the uh, International Society for Science and Religion. So among his many books, I will not list all the books he has uh, written and uh, edited, um, uh, the most recent one, which is, I think it is the most recent one, uh, which is uh, directly uh, interesting for our topic here, is the book uh, Artificial Intelligence, Modern Magic uh, or Dangerous Future, published by Icon Books. Um, I thought in 2020, but actually I saw now that it was published in 2019, um, which um, contains a, um, a, a very readable introduction also to, uh, to the field of, um, of art artificial intelligence, what all this is really about. So I uh, warmly suggest reading this book. Today's, art, uh, today's uh, 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 talk uh, is entitled, as I said, Artificial Intelligence and Religion. Uh, Yorick, you will have 25 to 30 minutes for your presentation, and then we'll have another um, uh, 25 minutes or so for discussion. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you very much for having me. I should correct one thing there. I misled you in, in some way, or well, my prose did. Um, I'm no longer a senior research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute. That's uh, that's in the past, a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, okay, I'll just start the stopwatch here. Okay, um, artificial intelligence and religion. Here's a picture to start us off. Uh, it, it has no particular uh, uh, theoretical bearing. It's just a, a picture I like. It's a gigantic Tibetan prayer wheel being turned by a stream somewhere in Tibet. Um, it, it pulls together rather nicely the idea of automation and religion, that this thing is automatically praying all the time in the stream. I rather like it as an early example of the kinds of things we'll be talking about later. And what to talk about? I want to say something initially about cybernetics, the old embarrassing um, relative of AI. Um, and its relationship to AI. And I'll say something about Wiener and, and mention Stafford Beer in passing. Uh, I'll say something about theology of omniscience and benevolence, and its relationship to this topic. Then three sections on romantic visions as machi romantic visions of machines as perfect, um, making human-like things, augmenting humans, and God machines and AI religions. And finally, a section on 
automating religious practice. Um, cybernetics you, is a word that's rarely used in English now. Um, it was the old pre-AI study in the 50s and 60s. It rested on continuous mathematics. It was anti-representation, rested on analog rather than digital computing. It was interested in the organizations of animals and insects. It was models were based on brains and networks rather than digital machines. And its key concepts were feedback and learning. The key thing people can remember about it are some tortoises that Grey Walter constructed that went about a room looking for electric plugs to plug themselves in and keep going. Um, traditional symbolic AI grew up in the 1950s and 60s. It was quite different. That's the tradition I grew up in, based on representations and logic, digital hardware, and the idea that intelligence was independent of brains, animals, and humans. That was John McCarthy's view. It wasn't interested in statistics or continuous mathematics. And now, of course, as many of you know, this, pa this paradigm has declined itself since the 1990s with the rise of machine learning, which is in some ways a reversion back to the ideas of cybernetics. Um, I sometimes think of cybernetics as the old discredited ancestor of AI locked in the attic and forgotten, but it, now it's out of the attic again. It's out and about and with the rise of machine learning and has it has many of its features. But cybernetics was very important in a cultural way. It influenced much modern French thought, for example, and Lyotard and others. Norbert Wiener is the name that most people know. Um, he tried. He was the person who made feedback into a, uh, a, a, a definite mathematical notion. He wrote a book called God and Golem, um, a comment on certain points where cybernetics impinges religion. The Golem, remember, was a clay possibly an automaton in the Jewish traditions of 16th century Prague. Fina argued in this monograph in 1961 that there was a, a cosmic evolutionary significance to self-reproducing machines, which didn't exist then, but he thought we were on the edge of them, and that they were now in principle possible, he said, and that humans would then take on a key function of God that made things in its own image. That was the shift. That's, in a sense, a, a cliche now, but that was a fairly original thing to say in 1961. For him, evolution was just the mechanism for doing this. And cybernetics is part of evolution. Um, he, and he asked the, a question which will echo back at the end of the talk. What he asked is the image of such a machine to be. Uh, theology of omniscience. Um, we know what omniscience is in principle, don't we? I'll, I'll, at the end, I'll argue that we may not be so sure about we knowing what it is. There's knowing everything. It's a classic property of God. The plus is demon in the 19th century knew the positions and velocities of all atoms in the universe. Um, but of course, it would have taken more computing that could be done in the history of the universe to store that. In other words, knowing everything about atoms isn't possibly a computable property. Um, I'll ask later, perhaps, if the World Wide Web is approaching a state that practically knows everything as facts. And a very important idea I should want to come back to is Arthur Danto's point that knowing all the facts is not knowing the significance of anything. This is an important point, I think. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, let me say something about consciousness in this regard. This isn't to talk about consciousness, but could something, could an, an entity that knew everything, a god, could it be conscious? Um, a consciousness seems to imply attention or focus. Um, there's a British TV series called Years and Years, last year, I think, that had an interesting idea of a girl with a brain implant so she could be aware of everything in the world, including every beggar in Delhi. And if you think about that, how could you be aware of everything in the world? How could you be? It, it leads to the idea that possibly something that knew everything couldn't also be conscious, which is an idea I'm not sure the theologians have had time or energy to grapple with yet. Um, but it's in a sense, this idea is there in Leibniz. If you know Leibniz's philosophy, the monadology, the supreme monad for Leibniz is God, and God is aware of everything in all other lower monads, which is us and everything that's in the world. Leibniz, I think, did have this idea of consciousness. He called it perception, but I think it's very much what we would call now consciousness, that God was aware of everything in every other monad that constituted the universe and was the only thing that was supremely conscious. Let's talk about benevolence for a moment, another traditional property of God. Um, Nick Bostrom, many of you may know, published a popular book called Superintelligence, where he argued that a superintelligence would not be benign, it would probably destroy us. 
Um, he thought that they were a real danger, and that if so, they'd just be one of them. They'd be, as it were, monotheistic, and they would destroy us. Um, I think he's completely wrong, and I've argued this in print in various places, um, partly because I don't think there's any reason to think we will create such things, but also for the following reason, which might have occurred to you. Humans have generally thought they're created benign. That's a general view. There's some religions that don't think that. So why would a superintelligence not continue that tradition and, and consider us as benign? We are, we are his creators, if he exists. Why wouldn't he be well disposed to us? Why would he wish to destroy us? I think that's a, a powerful thought worth holding in mind. Let's go to this idea, which I think comes out of, much of it comes out of 19th century romantic German thought of making of machines that are perfect and making human-like things. And of course, making better humans and making human-like things is one of the oldest ideas. It's an Ovid. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the story of Galatea and Pygmalion. Uh, Pygmalion makes the statue Galatea that comes to life. Um, Kleist, in his Marionettentheater, um, has this extraordinary idea, which I think is very powerful, harks back to what I just said, that puppets are more perfect than we are. Uh, they don't have consciousness. He says their feet don't touch the ground. And he thinks perfection is a step towards godlikeness by definition. And again, this is back to the idea that God might not be conscious. But the most important thing for us here is this idea that automata puppets could be more perfect than we are. Um, there's a famous French picture that you may know from the 19th century of Galatea coming alive and stepping down from her podium into the arms of the sculptor. Uh, John Gray, who's a thinker who's influenced me quite a bit, I don't know if you know him, um, he's written quite a bit about Kleist and the soul of the marionette. And he, Gray has explored the idea that self-awareness or consciousness in some sense is a barrier, can be a barrier to freedom, as he thinks it was in Kleist. We tend to think the opposite must obviously be true. And he, I think, explores quite interestingly the opposite idea. J.D. Bernal, a very famous scientific guru in Britain in the 1920s said consciousness itself might vanish and a humanity that had become completely etherealized but now I was thinking exactly this thought and of course if you know mystical and eastern traditions of of thought you know that much of their thinking is devoted to the idea of overcoming consciousness consciousness is an impediment the, the and on that very note of Eastern thought, you may be aware that Japanese and Buddhist approaches to machines is quite different. Here's a quote from a president of the Robotic Society of Japan. In Japan, we believe all animate objects have a soul. So a metal robot is no different from a human in that respect. There are less boundaries between humans and objects. On that Japanese view, there's no problem in making machines like us. And that, of course, machines have their own souls and old spirits. The, um, the way in which you can see this is the fact that the Japanese undoubtedly have found less resistance to taking robots into their homes and lives than Westerners have. Let's now look at romantic visions of machines as perfect. Um, this is the doctrine that's known as transhumanism. This could fill up a whole lecture. There's a movement coming out of America in the last 20 years on transforming the human condition by developing and making widely available sophisticated technologies to enhance humans intellectually and physically um, via body parts. I mean, a lot of energy in America, and probably in other countries as well, goes into making stronger and more perfect soldiers, more dangerous soldiers, um, more powerful much stronger limbs. Um, another aspect of transhumanism is brain upload um, and consideration of what it would be to have an immortal digital existence in an artificial environment. Um, a third idea, which is perhaps closer to the heart of the talk, is that of making gods um, directly into AI and religion. Um, making gods isn't a new idea, of course. Um, Abrahamic faiths were arose to be a to be against exactly that. I mean, Roman emperors created themselves as gods. The Bible has Aaron's golden calf and Baal and the god of iron, the golem. These are all bad things in the Bible and have always been bad things for the three Abrahamic faiths, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. All representations of living things are haram in Islam, as you know. Um, and this is at various revolutionary moments in the history of Western religion, Protestantism in the West, iconoclasm in the East, um, people have risen up in large numbers and smashed statues, smashed images. Um, the question that's been raised, certainly by these American movements in recent years, is could superintelligences be gods 
Not as enhanced humans, we just saw, but as gods. Um, Ray Kurzweil, a sort of AI guru, says that super intelligences will be fused with the human, but not everybody thinks they will. Bostrom, we saw, thinks they'll be monotheistic, inhuman, and utterly malevolent. We just talked about that. Um, Vina toyed in his monograph, his cybernetic monograph, on what the image of the machine is to be. And he thought it was probably the ultimate machine is unknowable. He didn't say it was godlike, although the golem has godlike features. He said that the ultimate automaton, that you yourself don't know anymore what that automaton will be. It's an extraordinary thought that the ultimate automaton will be something we can't know or understand. Um, sing the singularity has been grown out of transhumanism as a as an aspect of AI religion. Neil Lawrence, who's a an ex-colleague of mine who I listen to acutely, he's the new professor of machine learning at Cambridge. He satirized singularism as follows. In, sim in singularism, doomsday is the technological singularity when machines take over. The moment at which computers rapidly outstretch, out, outstrip, excuse me, our capabilities and take over the world. They're high priests of the scientists. The aim is to bring about the latter while restraining the former. He satirizes as rapture for nerds. And Yudovsky, who's been in this movement to some degree, has referred to singularitarian principles. But the, the main man in AI religion, this American cult, and of course, most modern cults come from America one way or another, is Lewandowski. He, he actively promoted on the web and elsewhere the development of the realization of a godhead based on artificial intelligence. Um, he registered the way of the future as a registered church. Um, since I've been writing this lecture over the last year or so, um, he's actually, I think, withdrawn some of this now. Um, some of this harks back to Stafford Beer, the early cybernetician. Um, that for Stafford Beer as the early cybernetician, Quote, to people reared in a good liberal tradition, man is in principle infinitely wise. He pursues knowledge to its ultimate. But to the cybernetician, man is part of the control system. This is an opposition I want to push through the remains of the talk between knowing everything, being infinitely wise, which is the doctrine we often refer to as Gnosticism, the old Greek cult, as it were, and cybernetics. Cybernetics didn't think we could know everything and everything was knowable for Neumann always referred to the unknowability of, of such entities because for the cybernetician, man is part of the control system. Uh, the World Wide Web as we have it is very much the weapon of the Gnostic, of knowing everything, the knowing everything in your with the phone in your pocket as some people see it. Um, let's now go to um, automating religious practice. Um, this is this is a, this can be a very trivial section. There's a wide range of applications out there. I'm not going to survey them for you, from the trivial to the promising. I mean, we saw the trivial, like the opening Tibetan prayer wheel in a stream. Many are simply aut automate access to texts and services. If you if you have Siri in your house, one of the current <coughs> all-purpose commercial dialogue systems and helpers you can have in your house that will read you religious texts if you want. It's not an intellectually interesting exercise. Um, there, there's Mindar, which we'll come to in a moment, which is a kind of Japanese version of a machine god. Um, there's other efforts to try and um, create and automate the role of priests and confessors in dialogue, something I've been looking at myself quite recently in a new research project. Here's Mindar, a strong version of an artificial god. This, if you could look him up on the web, he's a robot Buddhist priest in Japan who's available for blessings and funerals. Um, I don't know how successful or worthwhile he is, but there he is. Um, it was um, it, 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 its form is that of a Buddhist mercy figure uh, in, who was in the Kodaji Temple in Kyoto. Um, he gives sermons, advice, prayers, some interaction. Um, it emphasizes what we talked earlier as the Eastern attitudes that all beings, all entities have the potential to become enlightened. All entities in principle contain spirits, which of course includes machines. Um, at the more trivial level now, apparently I, I gather that in China, if funeral services are now connect, conducted by automata, they're cheaper. Uh, there's a, a practical, um, a practical um, example. And again, 
nothing is new, nothing is new under the sun. In, in the 16th century Europe, there were mechanical praying monks you could, you could see exhibited. I mean, people have been playing with this idea east and west for a very long time. Um, let's, let's just go back again to this opposition of Gnosticism and cybernetics. Um, Gray has this phrase, Gnosticism is the faith of people who believe themselves to be machines. Um, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with it. I, I know what he means. Um, Yuval Harari, who's a great writer of popular books, has referred to something like the same movement as modern man has traded off meaning and significance for full knowledge and control. Gnosticism is the idea that humans can have full knowledge. And in order to get this, Yuval Harari thinks we've given way to some form of sort of rather cheap scientism where we've lost the sense of meaning and significance that our ancestors have. In, he means, of course, in more religious ages. Um, and Lawrence, the, uh, the Cambridge machine learning man that I referred to earlier, um, he's contrasted godlike AI as all-knowing and has asked, would it be a protective mother if it existed? Or would it be the oppressive father? which in Bostrom's, um, Bostrom's bad future that we discussed of superintelligence, where not an oppressive father, but a slaughtering father would kill us. But Lawrence argues, perhaps we should see a future godlike AI as a protective mother. But, and I'd, I'd like to expand on this in a moment and towards the end. Um, godlike AIs, remember, they're going to have to talk to us in language. This is very important. Um, we can't imagine communicating with a godlike thing machine, real, or transcendental, in anything but language. And this will constrain, in a way, what kinds of things they can be. Um, uh, Wittgenstein, I think, used to make some version of the point that um, no entity can understand language better than us. Um, we control language, natural languages, English, German, Italian. Um, no entity could know them better than us. We know how they are. We created them. We own them. Nothing could know, understand them better. And something will have to function at our speed. I'll come back to the significance of that. Um, uh, an entity that's godlike must communicate in language, and that will constrain its nature to some degree. Um, let's think about human uniqueness again. Uh, this, of course, in traditional theology, this is what's called imago dei, that um, humans are created in God's image. But what is this human uniqueness? Um, following along some thoughts of Lawrence, Lawrence thinks that he's argued, I've only, I shouldn't put too much weight on what he thinks. I maybe, I've only heard one lecture by him. I should maybe putting too much weight on what he's saying. But he thinks that human uniqueness is constructed partly in terms of language, which many theoreticians have said. I mean, this is not novel. But here's the interesting point Lawrence makes. Humans are distinguished from machines because of our slow output devices. Um, machines transfer data at enormous rates of gazillions of bits a second. Humans can only output a few bits a second, like I'm doing now, though I'm speaking fairly fast. Um, we have very tiny signals between ourselves. How can we convey so much to each other, humans, with so little data? The tiny things we say, whereas machines can dump gazillions of bits on each other in a second. This is the some contrast he wants to make. And Lawrence thinks that this fact about language has conditioned how our minds are and created the minds we have, that we have, as it were, tiny signals between ourselves to convey huge meanings. And this, he believes, is only possible, and again, this is conventional AI, not Lawrence. And many people have said this, I'm sure I've spent my life saying it too, that we can only communicate with each other, humans, because we have these enormous stored knowledge structures in our heads. Uh, models of each other, models of the world, um, artificial intelligence and psychology in some sense are about what are these models in our heads that we have um uh recent developments in machine learning have brought this into question because in machine learning theory models are not so important but the limitations of that view are becoming clear now in machine learning without models and much machine learning is now going over to the creation of some form of model by empirical methods um so Lawrence and, uh, has argued, and, and others, and I think I have too, that what's interesting about humans, part of their 
the absolute uniqueness is that we, we communicate, we're the only things that do communicate in language, and we do so because of these vast models, and therefore because we have these huge models in our head, we can communicate with tiny signals because we can take so much for granted in the other person. You know this difference when you see people communicating Japan always occurs to me in this connection where J the Japanese seem to say less to each other than Westerners. Partly, I think, because I have a view that as a very homogenous society, they understand each other better and they don't need to say very much. The English are sometimes accused of this too, but they communicate a, a lot with very small signals. Um, let's go back to human uniqueness and omniscience again in, in, in concluding. Um, contrast of meaning and facts. When I was a philosophy student in Cambridge many years ago, John Wisdom was the professor of metaphysics. And one of his standard lines of argument was the difference between, as it were, um, what things mean and detailed facts. So he would take a sentence, one of his sentences was, Prussia attacked France in 1870. And he used to ask, he was in the analytic philosophical tradition, he used to ask, what does that really mean? Well, we sort of know what it means, a historical fact. Not terribly interesting now, but I mean, it, countries don't move, so Prussia can't move on France. What it really means is that very large numbers of Prussians moved across the territory in Europe and moved into another territory. But that's the point he's making. When we say that sentence and mean it, we don't mean all the facts that underpin it because they don't tell us very much. Um, so we're back again to where I was a moment ago with human uniqueness is the difference between the significance of what language means and having the full data, the difference between the full data and what language really means. So that machines at the moment, and this is a Lawrence point, tend to communicate with you know, masses of dumped data, but that can be vacuous and meaningless if we can't see what the significance of it is. So he's arguing well, I don't know if he's arguing, I'm arguing now, I suppose this is me, that machines in the future will have to communicate like us, as gods have always communicated like us. And that's why we can see, in some sense, a convergence line between them. Arthur Danto pushed this line about meanings and facts very strongly in his philosophy years ago. He argued that knowing all possible facts and data isn't knowing the meaning of events for us or for more importantly for historians. Um, and th that was an obvious point. Wisdom and Danto were making something like the same point. Knowing all possible facts is not knowing significance. The problem is, where is the significance? Um, in a sense, it's a trivial question. We know where it is. Well, but where do we? I mean, do we know what the Prussia sentence means? The more you look at it, the more you begin to wonder if you do know what it means. Although it's not any doubt, it's a fact, it's clear. And yet, and yet, and yet. But think of the consequences of that for notions like omniscience. Um, omniscience can't just mean knowing all the facts. It can't just mean knowing every sparrow that falls. It must kn mean knowing the significance. And I, I suspect this, if I was a proper theologian, I would know that theologians in the past had attacked this problem seriously. I'm thinking of it purely from a modern artificial intelligence point of view. Um, but there's a consequence for omniscience there, what it can mean both for gods and for machines. Uh, we humans are not at risk of omniscience, but gods are said to, God is said to be omniscient. Machines would like to be there in some sense and may get there. But what will that mean? What will it be for us to know that they know the significance of things and not merely all the data? So back to Imago Dei, let's end up where pretty much where we started. Um, Imago Dei, the image of God in us, must include our knowledge of meanings. What is that? And could machines also possess it? I believe they could. I'm an AI person. I believe in principle that machines can do anything we can do. There's nothing in principle reserved to us. But this will mean knowing significance over and above data, which, uh, which is what gods do, which means they, God cannot simply know all the simple low-level facts. And indeed, the Bible sometimes suggests he does. But I suggest that we have to reconsider that. 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yorick, for this um, great talk. We now have time for uh, discussion. I already see that Oliviero has raised uh, his hand. Um, please, um, the best way to, to, for me to keep track of questions, just drop a line in the chat.
because otherwise I don't see all uh, um, all cameras on the screen, so I might miss you. Um, anyway, let's start with um, Oliviero. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Yori. Hello. Thank Hi, Oliviero. You. Hello. Long time no see. Long time. And uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking that this was uh, the, the, the current one was the latest of uh, 44 years of great talks of yours that I attended to. This was really fascinating. I, I really appreciate it. Um, now, let's come uh, to the question. Um, one thing that I expected you to add is uh, uh, something that is very common in many religions, so that uh, in the end you would meet the dead. You would meet again uh, somewhere. And, um, and uh, so what are your thoughts about uh, AI as a means for talking to the dead? The, in principle, I think that in the future we can think that we would accumulate so much uh, uh, language about a dead person and at one point we would be very able in building creative systems uh, so that really you could bring back to life uh, a dead person in the perception. But there is something beyond that that you foresee. What's your thought about that? Well, it, it, thank you for the question. I mean, it's funny you should say that because I have actually written articles, some of them popular articles with titles like Speaking to the Dead. And this grew out of uh, the last very big European project I had about 10, 15 years ago called Companions. I still think it's at the top of my slides, actually. Probably shouldn't be. But it came out of me starting to work on dialogue in the 90s. And then I began to write and publish books on things called Companions. So that we'd had artificial companions that live, would live with us all our lives, would, you know, be good company for the old, would assist the old, but they could be for anybody, children, the old, that we, we certainly will have these companions. Since I wrote like that 20, 25 years ago, of course, companions are springing up around us all the time now. So the next move was this. Um, once you've got a companion that knows everything you've said and written for years, and given that we can now do fake videos and complete imitations of voices, there's no reason at all why after death, your companion shouldn't become a simulacrum of you. It could sound like you, look like you on a screen, not a physical robot, look like you on a screen, would know all you knew, and your children could go on talking to it and possibly asking it the questions they'd never asked you in life. I mean, like I never asked my parents where they met. If I had my mother's companion, maybe I could ask my mother's companion that, and it would tell me because it would, in a sense, be my mother. So, yes, I think we will in, undoubtedly be talking to the dead in that sense of having full simulacra of people who have gone that we can talk to. And this will give either give a great deal of comfort for people or make them feel uneasy. The only trouble is, of course, as everybody knows, that's not quite the same thing that people meant by immortality. Um, it, it's OK for the survivors, but the person who's dead on that view remains thoroughly dead, which isn't quite what the theologians had in mind. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see other questions at the moment, if I uh, haven't missed anyone. Um, so maybe I can uh, I can ask one. Actually, I have, I have a series of questions, but I will just ask um, uh, one really, um, uh, which concerns uh, the the one point you made when you said that okay, um, regarding our humans' uh, slow output devices, uh, that we can uh, communicate uh, a lot of significant not of uh, um, uh, content um, by. Um, uttering um, uh, very short strings of, 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 of sounds, uh, basically. And what you said, why can we do that? Well, we can do it because we can take so much for granted. And I think this is, uh, this is a very, um, very important um, uh, issue here. Um, 
because if I got it correctly, then uh, one, let's say, one um, problem or major problem in uh, simulating um, um, human-like conversation agents uh, is basically that uh, things like common sense inference, things like uh, like associations that we commonly take for granted that everyone has them, cannot be um, cannot be easily uh, um, automatized, basically automated. Um, um, but now people tell me, well, look, uh, all this is going to change because we have those huge amounts of data, and we can uh, we can use these um, uh, um, these uh, uh, statistical uh, inferences to to simulate common sense knowledge. What, what what is your take on this? Is this because you you also talked about the the difference between the um, uh, symbolic approach to AI and the uh, sub -symbol or non symbolic approach to AI and so on? How how do you see developments in that field? Is that is big data going to be able to, uh, to put us into a position to um, create uh, machines with common sense? <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, I think, the most interesting question of all at the moment that no one knows the definite answer to. I mean, for me, the last spasm of the symbolic AI movement before, before the machine learning monster sort of grew up and took over everything, the last spasm of the symbolic AI movement was the semantic web movement. And that hasn't died. I don't think it's died. I think it's alive and well, but it's not. It's the movement associated with people like uh, Tim Berners-Lee and, um, you know, the creator of the web. And the, sim the semantic web was, he wrote this paper in the Scientific American with um, Jim Handler and so somebody else whose name I can't pronounce. Um, he wrote this paper about 15 years ago where he said the next move in knowledge representation is a semantic web, which is the World Wide Web, but the World Wide Web where it knows the meaning of the things it contains. So in the World Wide Web, of course, it doesn't know the meaning of the newspapers that are out there, but the semantic web does. The semantic web would be something that had representations of everything it had, images, texts, and would know what it had, and you, as it were, could reason with it and talk to it. And that's what I was really, when I talked about the World Wide Web, knowing everything in my talk, I was really thinking of the semantic web movement that uh, Hendler and Berners-Lee intended. And it hasn't gone away. I mean, it really is out there. And somehow it's got fused now with the big data movement, um, which is not the same as the machine learning movement. The big data movement, there's a center in London run by Nigel Shadbolt, which is a direct offspring from Berners-Lee's associated with it, which thinks that if you could just put enough data in and somehow convert it, add its significance to it by annotation, you would have something like the semantic web. And the clearest example of this are the medical semantic webs we have, which modern medicine relies on entirely for research, that there are the parts of the semantic web that have medicine on, know, as it were, because of ontologies and knowledge structures of various kinds, know what's in them. So what I'm trying to say is, I must cut this short, this is too long an answer, sorry. Um, the symbolic attempt before machine learning arose to know everything in a conscious, almost a conscious way, the semantic wave movement hasn't gone away and is out there and has become fused, as I said, with the big data movement. Um, and it's going ahead. Um, uh, when we look at, oh, um, uh, in our cars, when we, we look at the systems that guide us with cars and know where all the restaurants are, this is part of the semantic web in a sense that knows where everything is and what its significance is. Okay, now, machine learning has come along and said, no, no, we don't want representations, although they're, they're weakening on that resolve. All we need are enough factors, enough vectors, enough dimensional vectors in our paradigm. And our, if, our, if our learning network is big enough, it will know everything without representations. And you know, the example they use is GPT-3. GPT-3 is the, the system that has, I forget how many gazillions of connections. And it's the one that's producing the prose that is eerily realistic. And people who see it say, my God, it's telling jokes. 
it's writing journalism. It's going to produce novels next, but even though it doesn't know what it's doing, and that's the problem. We have now in front of us two completely different paradigms for knowing everything. The GPT-3 paradigm, which produces, I say, completely realistic text. It's extraordinary. It, some of it's even funny. Um, I'm producing a lecture on AI and humor, and I've, I've actually quoted GPT-3 abstruse joke. It's quite funny, really. It made it up. Um, it can do journalism. And yet, on the other hand, we still have the semantic web alive and well, which is symbolic, rests on logical representations, and thinks that that's the way to have, as it were, self-conscious knowledge of everything. And we can't decide between those at the moment. That's not much of an answer, but that's where we are. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, next uh, is Paolo Costa with a question. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. And thank you for the for the talk. Um, um, well, as I was listening to your presentation, I was wondering whether you're familiar with the idea of a, an axial turn in the history of religions. Because I didn't the, hear the keyword, sorry. Well, an axial turn. Uh, yes, the axial. This idea that in the first millennium uh, before the common era, there was a sort of world revolution in religion and involving uh, Judaism and Platonism and, and Buddhism and Confucianism. And that the core of this revolution was the discovery of transcendence. But maybe uh, it would be better to say that the, 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 the revolution was the discovery of the gap between the world and something else. So the crucial aspect of this experience uh, is that, of course, you, uh, you cannot reduce the one to the other. So for example, the sin of idolatry is the, the worst sin uh, in, in this tradition. This idea that you worship the false reality, the false aspect of reality. Um, um, I was wondering, yes, as I was listening, if you see a sort of parallel here between the distinction between significance and facts and this interpretation of the core of the religious experience, because there is this idea that the core of the spiritual or religious experience uh, people can have is precisely in, in keeping this gap open and never close it yeah so i used to think that there if there is something lacking in the current discussion about religion and ai it's precisely this lesson that we learn from the evolution of religion um, in human history so thank you very much yes i mean there's a deep point there i'm not sure i'm competent to tackle it of course i'm aware I'm aware of what you're calling the axial turn. I mean, the fact that in that first millennium before Christ, um, extraordinary number of religious developments took place, religious and philosophical developments. And I, I know the main ones you're talking about. This is absolutely right. And the notion of transcendence does describe them. And you're absolutely right. And it's a, a freedom from, as it were, um, uh, uh, one would say, I mean, this is what iconoclasts always say, isn't it? I mean, and it's very strong in the in the Old Testament, the freedom from false gods the freedom from mechanical gods the freedom from idols and it comes back with various forms of iconoclasm it's still very active in islam yes yes i understand that um where one places that in relation to what i was talking about i'm not sure i mean it would be easy to say that any kind of ai god which of course i don't take totally seriously i i'm not here to sort of <laughs> I'm not here as an evangelist for AI gods. I'm a, I'm a describer. I don't find Lewandowski particularly plausible. Um, the only plausible, which of course, if there were an AI god, you could say, well, it's just one more of these idols. It's not transcendent. But having said that, let me back off a little. You see, the cyberneticists, who I didn't give a lot of space to, I had to cut the lecture down to about half its size, and a lot of what went was talking about the early cyberneticists, particularly Stafford Beer. Um, the early cyberneticists, they 
they were onto this. I mean, particularly this idea that because we are part of the system, the world system, um, therefore we can't know what the sort of transcendent thing will be like. It, you could see it in the talk when I quoted um, von Neumann, I think, von Neumann, who is not a cyberneticist really, but he said, we can't know what the ultimate automaton will be like. So in a way, in those early speculations in AI and cybernetics, there was an element of what I think you were talking about, that people revisiting the ultimate automaton, which would be a huge shift. I mean, for Bostrom, it's the most disastrous thing in evolution. It's going to kill us all. But whatever it is, it won't be knowable. We won't understand how it works. We won't understand what its desires and its plans and its motives and what its plans for us are. So that's the place, if I was to dig into what you're saying, that's the place where I would look for transcendence emerging in AI and religion. The idea that we can't yet know what the ultimate automaton will be like. Thank you. The next question is uh, from Inken, Inken Paul. The floor is yours. Hi. Hi, Yorick. Uh, nice to meet you finally. Hello. Um, yes, I have a comment and a question, um, or not a comment, an invitation, because uh, I was, uh, um, how shall I put that? Um, your comments about Japan were very exciting for me because I'm uh, from Japanese studies and I would like to talk about this in the future further, particularly the idea uh, that uh, the Japanese have a soul. I mean, uh, I think uh, this is, uh, you quoted this uh, Minoru Son, I think it was, uh, who said uh, something about uh, that the Japanese believe that all the human beings have a, an animated soul or something. I think that's... Uh, that's uh, very modern, and um, I think it would be difficult to find many Japanese who would agree. But my more important question is, I am actually horrified by your uh, very, very wonderful and accessible talk, because um, I attended uh, many conferences on data feminism uh, lately. And uh, the general conclusion was that most of the data uh, which are fueling our big machine and AI, are um, the data are from white men. So um, and that uh, and so um, you said now, and I never heard that in that way that um, it will be possible to create a machine who has a common sense. No, not really common sense, but who knows all. So after today or in this moment, I imagine. You've frozen. I lost you in mid-sentence. We, we can't hear you anymore, Inken. You're... Am I back? Uh, yes, now you are back. OK, so I make it short. Imagining now, yeah, as a white man who is knowing all about us. What do you think about that? Well, let me think. I'm, I'm, I'm fumbling beside me because he looks, I'm fumbling first of all for this book. Do you know this book by Jennifer Robertson called Yes, Robo Sapiens Japan Japanicus? Yes, yeah, she's a friend of mine. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I mean, much of what I, when I say anything about Japan and AI, some of what I'm saying is coming out of that book. Okay. She, I think what I've said about Japan there is, and she, of course, speaks Japanese and was brought up there. Um, she broadly, much of what I said comes from that book. And um, uh, so what I said was consistent with her. So I, I don't think I was trying to be misleading about Japan. And I was quoting various Japanese roboticists. I've been there many times, but I don't claim to know Japan. Um, I do think they have a different take on AI. I think this goes way back before the Second World War. I, I've, you know, she, she, she looks at historical comics and things before the war and shows how different the Japanese attitude was to having such robots in the house and so on that they were very earlier they were early adopters even when the technology didn't exist i, I think there is a very different sort of attitude there connected with the history of buddhist thought but again this is not my field so i'm not really competent to say much about it just to point at it um but your second and more very substantive point about data feminism as you call it um yeah well i'm aware of the issue because um oh well i mean you must be aware of what's been going on at google with the paper by Emily Bender and uh, Timu Gebru. Uh, Timu Gebru got fired. 
yeah. uh, over this and uh emily bender of course can't get fired because she's a professor and she's someone with whom i've had a number of clashes on committees in the past emily bender and i don't get on um so in fact yeah one of us had to leave the committee and if she hadn't left i'd have left um so but then she left so i didn't have to um but it's a very difficult one isn't it um when you say all data is collected by men i you see so much of data doesn't seem to me to have much to do with sex or gender at all i mean you know gender is uh, sorry a uh, data is stuff like medical data and um weather data and transport data i can't myself see all this as heavily loaded towards males i, I know there's all kinds of facts like you know uh, car car dummy tests in crashes is done with dummies that tend to be have the weight of men i know that one and you can pick out things i agree but of course as you know better than i do perhaps that the what part well part of what bender and deborah have focused on has been language data and they claim that of course it's not so much i think about sex and gender they've claimed of course there's a lot of racist data gets into the data pool and shouldn't they really want language data to be as it were cleansed and sanitized and i can't for the life of me go along with that i think if we start to have a world of machine learning i'm not in machine learning world much do a bit of it but if we go into a world where all language data has to be cleansed and sanitized it's a very very dangerous world we'll just take out the political language that we don't like um if democrats are in america if democrats are running data collection they'll take out all the text by republicans i mean i don't think the point thing you're pointing at is simply a sex and gender issue i think it's also a political issue and i don't see any easy way out of it if we start cleansing data what's your way out i mean what's your solution um well i think it's it's not only the dummies test particularly in medical data there is so much uh, there's so much more data on on male health than on women's health uh, and then i wasn't saying that uh, the men are collecting the data i said that the data is on men so i imagine now this ai this uh, omni uh, this uh, this uh, ai which knows all that its knowledge it's based on male thinking and not on on white male thinking and not on uh, it's just my question and not on on thinking which is taking into account men women trans um, different cultures races you name it and i think this is problematic i'm i do not want to sanitize anything i want to collect more data in a more non biased and balanced way well i mean if you take a very current hot issue the the data on which the vaccines are based against covid-19 i mean i i haven't looked lately i i was interested in this last year um when it was a new issue um i suspect these vaccines have been tested worldwide on very large representation representative samples of men and women i doubt very much if these vaccines have been tested simply on men you're not saying they have are you i mean no no i i didn't talk about covid no no not nowadays but that's the hot issue right now if you if your point was generally true you might expect that all the vaccine data we had was on men but it isn't uh that's been very interesting rhetoric um um boris had me out here <laughs> well i think i, I mean um uh, the the point if i got it correctly that that inkin wanted to make is that uh, there are um uh, various kinds of biases due to um due to uh, uh data sets that are being used to train artificial intelligence systems and which have um i mean it's, there, there are many cases um which have made it also into the into the press where um be it gender biases be it uh, um ethnic or in america they say racial biases uh, uh have made it into such systems which um and i think the point was just to say um uh, that's a problem and that should be tackled um in all uh by all means including including data sets that are used to train for machines 
So that's yes, but I know that's the point, and I know the point very well, of course. I know mm. the point from, you know, reading about the Google struggle with uh, you know, Bender and Tim Gebru. I mean, because I know the point very well. The, the trouble is, it, I mean, of course, in some sense, medical data sets should be chosen appropriately. And if they're not, that should be changed. Car crash data. I think people are so aware of this now. I suspect it would be very difficult to get any tests going now that weren't balanced. I mean, I think it's best to stick to sex balance here because that's roughly 50-50 in all cultures and we know where we are. Once you go to racial balance, the whole game changes because racial balances vary so much from population to population that the whole game changes. I mean, you can't have equal representation of, uh, of black of black subjects in an American study because there's not very many of them so, and so on. So it's best to stick to sex because that's 50-50 and we know where we are. And of course, I think we can all agree it's not a fight that uh, data should be collected, uh, you know, except for prostate cancer, of course, and gynecology. I mean, it varies with the disorder, but over other things, yes. And I, I, I would assume that people have got this message by now. I mean, I'd like to, I don't know, I'm pretty ignorant. I'd like to know to what extent now data is being collected in the biased way you suggest. Thank you. So uh, Robert has just said he'd like to jump in. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to comment on the question of how race might be pretty profoundly relevant. I mean, one of the, as I'm sure you're aware, the studies on facial recognition and automated cars, right? Where, where the cameras and everything that, are, that you might plausibly put on a car to look for pedestrians couldn't see black people. So that's not like, that's a really important issue about how the data get accumulated. And you can't make assumptions that like, okay, if we've got men and women, we kind of got it settled. Because if a car is gonna drive down the road and it's not gonna see a portion of the population, that's a terrible thing. Right. And so it really does matter that we think about representation in, in data sets and that we think pretty broadly and depending on the domain of the data set and what we're trying to apply, the different kind of variabilities might change. Right. Like if it comes to a thing that's driving down the road, it needs to be able to see people who are of different heights, some people in wheelchairs or bicycles, different colors and so forth. That might not be relevant data in other domains, but things like, say, religious diversity in some domains, religious diversity is going to be a really important factor in how you're accumulating data, right? So I just want to push back on the idea that we can just kind of limit how we're thinking about data, but rather there has to be a conversation up front that says, okay, these are the kind of data we need in the kind of circumstances that we're in. And sometimes that requires having a lot of input from different kinds of voices. And I say this as a white male, or at least mostly white, I'm Jewish, so I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, but like white males frequently don't see the needs that other people see, right? And that was why there were kind of famous examples in Silicon Valley of a bunch of white dudes sitting around going, why can't our facial recognition see this black person, right? Because it hadn't occurred to them that other people didn't look quite like them and, and so on. So I think it really is important to think about those different voices that are necessary to ask the question of, what kind of data we need in any given domain. That's all. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand your point. I mean, because I don't think the problem with the white dudes in Silicon Valley was so much about race. It was because they had the assumptions of sort of nerdy, nerdy, hearted undergraduates. I mean, one of the jokes one likes to make about Facebook is Facebook, you know, which now incorporates, wasn't it, about half the world's population, is based entirely on the, as it were, the, the, the outlook and dating ideas of a Harvard undergraduate of 20 or 30 years ago. This is an extraordinary fact. This is the most terrifying fact. It's not just about them being male. It's about them being very, very narrow, a very, very narrow segment of, uh, of nerdy, uh, nerdy white males from elite American universities. It's much worse than that. It's not a male thing so much. It's very, very tightly narrow. But to, to go more broadly with your point, you see, I think there's two things we need to separate in what you're saying. Um, one is the general, and it, this has all come up, of course, and you're pointing at the key example of facial recognition in America. Um, one is the issue of facial recognition for all races, whether they're a minor part of the population or a major part of the population. And you can perfectly well, we can all perfectly well agree that um, systems should recognize all races. And indeed, well, huh, the motive for this is... Um, is obvious, I'm sorry to be uh, frank, but I mean, of course, in America where 
if, if facial recognition systems are often driven by the needs of the police, they're the very people who will want to recognize black faces. We know that. So it'd be very odd if they weren't backing the recognition of black faces, far from them being prejudiced against it, they would want to be funding it. You know that as well as I do. But I'd like to separate that question from the other thing you brought up, which is seeing people in the dark. I mean, that I think is just a, that's just a, a diversion. I mean, it's harder for people to see black people in the dark. I mean, it's just a fact um, that's obvious to everybody. I mean, that's going to continue to be true for automated cars. I mean, something's got to be done about it, of course, but it's going to be harder. Um, not everybody is on the same footing. Consider the fact that Japanese passports don't contain air, eye color and hair color like American and British passports do. You don't need to put hair and eye color in Japanese passports because everybody has the same, which must make facial recognition, if it were based on those facts, much harder. Of course, it isn't based on those facts, so it's all right. But that's the problem. Um, some peoples will be harder to recognize than others. And that's true. And it's a mess. But that's not a reason for not trying harder. I agree. Hmm. Okay, um, we've reached the uh, the end of today's uh, episode of our webinar series. Uh, thank you very much again, Yorick, for this very interesting talk. Um, thank you to everyone who has uh, joined us today, uh, participated in the discussion, or just uh, listened um, to uh, Yorick's uh, presentation and our discussions. Um, the next. Uh, episode of our webinar series will be on um, uh, the 24th of March and this will be by uh, Leron Schultz and he will be talking about using multi-agent AI to predict and prevent religious conflict. So adding in a sense a um, the question of whether and if so how AI uh, systems can be used as tools in research on religion. Uh, to the list of topics that we've uh, discussed so far. Um, so thank you very much again. Thank you very much again, Yorick. And, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I hope to see you again soon. That is next time when, uh, when we'll have our webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.